Well, hello everyone and welcome to Meet the Experts. We are at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. I'm Tim Barnes, uh, one of the science education specialists here. And every month we like to take you behind the scenes to meet the people who do the work of exploring the earth. And today we're going to find out about storing science on and for supercomputers. Uh, but before we continue, uh, just like to do a couple of housekeeping bits. Um, if you do have any technical troubles along the way, please feel free to hopefully can get to your chat. Uh, just put your request for assistance in the chat. Summer Watson, who's at our national, uh, the NCAR Wyoming Supercomputing Center, she's right on there. So I'll help you with any technical questions you might have along the way. And uh, we do have uh, live transcripts. So if captioning, live captioning is at the bottom, you should be able to initialize that if you need uh, captioning. And uh, I'm ready to get us started here and I'll introduce our guests today, uh, Jeanette and Joey, who are systems engineers at the NCAR Wyoming Supercomputing Center. But we should probably start out with what exactly is a systems engineer? Joey, what's a systems engineer? So the easiest answer is someone who manages the system, where a system can range from a single computer to a large cluster like our Cheyenne supercomputer to something like a storage system that you'll see today. Um, and basically, we're involved in the purchasing, the installation, the configuration, just running it, getting it to stay running, dealing with failures and maintenance, and then helping our user community make the best use out of it. Wow, so it's a, a jack lot. of all trades type of thing. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. And we just saw some pictures. Was was there a supercomputer in that picture? Is that what I saw? I believe so. Yeah, so this is Cheyenne. This is our this is our main supercomputer. It has four thousand and thirty two systems all connected together with a high speed network. And this is the main consumer of our storage system that you're about to see. Well, where's the keyboard i don't see a keyboard or a screen on that how does how do your users use that so it is all done remotely um you can log into it just from your laptop uh open up a little terminal and you can yeah just right like that you can just type run your jobs look at your data um yeah <laughs> wow that's that's pretty amazing and so the the users the people who are using this are they who who are the people who are using the supercomputer the science just the scientists and what do they do yeah so we have our NCAR scientists we have lots of students from graduate students postdocs and they do a lot of things <laughs> from research so they'll uh our main research is with our climate and weather models and the students have a variety of projects that they run. Wow, and does this operate 24 hours a day or do you, are there times when you turn the computer on and off or is it just run? Yeah, for the most part, it runs 24 seven outside of a few issues here and there. So yeah, you can log in at the middle of the night and do your work. <laughs> oh, wow. That sounds like it makes your job pretty important. And is Jeanette standing in front of, where's Jeanette right now? So I see her there. Everyone, this is Jeanette, one of our systems engineers. Yeah, I, I'm here at our data center at the uh, NCAR Wyoming Supercomputing Center. And here is where we house our supercomputers and our storage system that we'll talk about today. So this is where all the big computers are housed. Wow. So can you see Cheyenne from where you are? Yeah, so we'll take you over there and show you. It's right over here. So, stepping over here. Cheyenne is right there. And it, and it's connected to the, the Glade system. How does, how does that yeah. happen? They... Yeah, we have some high-speed network. It's a pretty fancy networking, and it's used to just connect the supercomputers with everything else in here, including the storage system. So it's a is that fancy so high speed network. Yeah. Is that what's in the ceiling? I see something yellow in the ceiling. Is that what's, is that what's connected? Yep. All these yellow 
things, these trays you see, they have networking in them. So that's how we're connecting things together through cables that run in these trays. And is this is this different from how the computers that we're used to? Is is this a different how is this different, I guess, from the computer storage that we use at maybe at our school or library? You want to take that, Joe? Sure. So for the most part, it at the base level, it's not too different, right? It's just made up of hard drives like you would have in a desktop computer. Um, and in this case, it's made up of about 17,000 of them. Yeah, he's talking about the and, storage system here, right? He's talking about Glade now in particular, not the computer, right, but Glade. So, yes. yeah, you want to talk about Glade? Sure. So these rectangles you see here are disk enclosures, and each one of them holds between 84 to 90 of these disks. And each of the green lights on front is basically the status of a single drive. One drive. Um, so these systems have 10 disk enclosures, and at the very top are a pair of controllers. And the controllers basically manage all the health of the system. They watch the disks for errors, and they end up serving the data to the supercomputer. Um, the controllers basically group the disks together, and we kind of you know build up a few layers of you know, ever increasing virtual disks out of these groups. And that's, uh, is, that is what gets presented to the computer, I guess. So the very top part is what's controlling all of what we see down below. Yep, so you can see, yeah, the four racks here each have a controller at the top. And is yeah, each same, same setup, right? Yep. And each one of those green lights that we see that represents one of the discs that's inside. Is that it? Yeah. Do you have an yep. example there, Joey, of a disc? Yeah. So, just a typical hard drive. Uh, the ones in our systems are slightly different. They're more, I don't know, enterprise grade discs, and they have different connectors. But we'll take a closer look here in a moment. But for the most part, they're the same that you would see in a desktop computer. Cool. So let's, let's go over, let's open up. We have a drawer over here on our test system that we can open up and take a look inside. So I'm going to step over there. Yeah, and so Glade was our, you know, we call it the big system. And so we have these smaller test systems so we can perform, you know, software updates and things like that without affecting the big system. And it's basically just to see if they work. This is just a big drawer. It's pretty heavy. We can open up its lid here. Have a look inside. So it's just uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve by by five. So there are sixty drives right here. Blade has more drives in its drawers, but this is, you know, a smaller test drawer. Uh, and I'll take one of these out. So it's just a disk, just like Joey showed you. Just like you have in a yeah. desktop at your school. Same kind of drive. But we have a lot of them. And how, how fast does it send... Does it, can it send that all, that looks like an awful lot of information. Can it, does it, how fast is it at sending this stuff out? So a single drive can run at about maybe 180 megabytes a second. But when you have 17,000 of them put together, uh, so the speed that Glade can run at is about 220 gigabytes per second. So uh, a megabyte probably... is a million, right? <laughs> So hard drive is yep. 180 million bytes a second it can do. And uh, but Glade, because we have all these drives and we can have them all working in parallel, uh, it can run at 220 gigabytes or billion or a thousand million, right? Bytes a second. So, you know, 
over a thousand times faster than just a single hard drive. And so for some we have... perspective, that amount of bandwidth is roughly equivalent to about 2,000 households worth of residential internet speed. <laughs> I wanted to make a quick note about that. We had a, a list of questions come in from a classroom and they said, how much storage can it hold? And so how many households did you say? So that was 2000 households worth of bandwidth, not of storage. Okay. Yes. So bandwidth. the total storage holdings is 128 petabytes worth, where a petabyte is a thousand million million bytes or a quadrillion. So it's a lot. And we do have a lot of questions. And then everyone, that was Summer's voice you just heard. Uh, I think maybe we should go through some of these questions right now to get some answers. Like, uh, can anyone use sure. a supercomputer? Almost. Oh. <laughs> I think in our case, uh, the basic requirement, I think, is a, a project and a grant from the National Science Foundation. And that can give you time on the computer to run your experiment. Or you can come work for us. Uh. <laughs> yeah, we use these computers mostly for studying the climate. And so you pretty much have to have like a climate uh, project. But if you have a climate project and you're at a, a, a university uh, that's NSF funded, you can get access to our computers. And that, that's fantastic. And the follow on question to that is how hard is it to find a supercomputer? Are there lots of them in the world? I would say, yeah. Uh, there's a list that gets published twice annually called the top 500, which lists the top 500 fastest computers in the world. But there are definitely a lot more than that. Uh, most of the national labs have at least one, some universities have at least one. And then corporations are starting to have some on their own as well. Okay. And a lot, a lot of, so, go ahead. I was just going to say that one of the industries that uses a lot of supercomputers is the oil and gas companies. They use it to try to find, um, you know, where the oil is underground. So they send big sonic waves through the earth. And when they bounce back, they collect that, and then they process it on supercomputers. So a lot of industries also use supercomputers. Excellent. And we have uh, some technical questions now. Someone was wondering, like, how do you keep this cool? And I think where Jeanette's standing, you can actually some of, see some of the vents in the yeah. floor. Would you like to talk a little bit about how, about how uh, we keep yeah. this from uh, wor uh, failing? Does it, does it ever overheat? And do any of these pieces and parts ever break? And, is that your job to fix things if something does go wrong? Now let me close this up really quick because I want to show you the 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 oh, I can't the project I need to go in, right? There it goes. All right. Can't break the supercomputer while we're showing it, right? Or the storage system. So we have a we have a vent in the floor here, and I don't know if you can see how it's blowing my hair up. Can you see that? See how it's blowing on my hair. So the yep. air comes up through the floor. We have cold air coming up through the floor. And then all of these systems, the storage systems, these floors, the controllers, the supercomputer, they all have big fans. And it, they pull the cold air through the computer, and that will then cool off the computer, just like an air conditioner. And then it blows the air out the back after it's been heated up. So over here on Blade, you know, you can see this is there's the same kind of perforated tile in front of it. So cold air is coming up, being pulled through blade, and then it goes into the back. And we're going to take you in there. So I'm going to kind of walk slow so Ben can keep up with me. Ben is one another systems engineer we have here. He's running the camera. <clears throat> so now you can tell it's kind of it's noisy in the machine room, but not nearly as noisy as it's going to be when I walk in here. So this is where all the hot air gets blown into. So you can see here, there's a, there's a thermometer up there. It says it's about 90 degrees in here. Where the machine room, it's about 70 degrees outside of this hot room. And you can hear how loud it is. Those are the fans that are pulling that air through. So it's pretty loud and hot in this room. 
So I'm going to step out. We're not going to hang out here too long. Loud and hot. So did that answer your question? Yes, you answered a lot of questions. Uh, someone was wondering if it was loud in there. And then there were yeah. a couple of other questions uh, about the kinds of data that are on Glade and from the supercomputer. And connected to that, uh, how will supercomputers help us advance? And this one question was about as a state, or can these computers help an advancement uh, for just one state or lots of states? Either one of you can take that question. Yeah, go ahead, Joy. <laughs> Sorry, what was the question? There's one so um, the, the, failures. The and... data, well, what kind of data do they have and oh, how do these actually help? You know, how's that helpful? I would say the majority of the data is probably weather and climate related. Um, if you imagine like a 3D box with clouds and temperature and stuff in there. That's roughly what gets saved out into a special type of file, I guess. And depending on the size of, you know, this domain, the files can be very large. And depending on how often you save your simulation, you can have lots of them. Uh, so I would say the majority of the data is model output, I guess, that the computers calculate and then just save. And are these, how, how are these useful to society? I think is kind of the question is, well, what difference does this kind of, does this work in these data? Uh, what difference does this data make in the world? I mean, research is research, right? You either learn something new or you learn something that you thought was gonna be new, but it didn't turn out to be that way. And right, yeah, a, and this, just piece by piece, yeah, this, you build up knowledge. We're trying to understand the climate, right? And it's a very complicated, large system itself, right? And so, you know, they take data and then they bring it here and then they they model what they think, the, how the climate works. And then they use the supercomputers and the data that they collect from the Earth to try to see if their models are predictive of the, how the climate changes. So it's, it's all about understanding the climate here. Um, you know, taking weather data, and there's also ocean data, as everybody knows now, and sun, and sun data. Uh, and they take that, and then they try to model it, to try to learn how our planet works. And that way they can help understand how we're changing the climate and how to keep from having, you know, uh, global warming, things like that. So uh, it's all about modeling that data that they bring into the supercomputers, trying to, trying to understand how the climate works. That, that sounds pretty important. And it also sounds like you have quite an expertise in something that's used around the world. Would you say that there are, there's a, a, a there's a big need for systems engineers? And could you work at lots of, could, could the two of you work at more than one supercomputing center on supercomputers? I mean, I there, say, there are yeah, jobs. Just... Yeah, go ahead, Joe. Go ahead, Joe. You talk this oh. one. I'd say, yeah, there's lots of opportunities. Um, you know, most businesses run some server or something at least on their very own, and that requires a systems administrator. So there's small scale opportunities to large scale opportunities like a data center or a cloud type of provider. Yeah. <laughs> I think I can supplement a little bit of that answer as well. Um, in your K-12 environment, you guys probably focus a lot on coding. And coding is not the same as systems administration. Systems administration builds the server so that the coders can provide their applications to run on that system. So if you're interested in systems administration, you're going to be very familiar with an operating system, with the components and the hardware within that system. And so there are a couple of different kinds of um, roles that you can take in the world of technology. Systems administration, which is what uh, our folks do here today. And then we also have networking, if you like connectivity and the internet and cybersecurity. And then there's also um, developers and the folks who create the software. So there's a little bit of everything. I know that you guys might focus on coding in your schooling. 
But um, one of the questions posed here by Karen is would school would schools or school districts use supercomputers? I'm gonna let the folks um, answer this, but I, I guess I want to also note that at your school district, you probably have similar roles. You probably have a systems administrator running your servers at the school. You have a network engineer who's creating your internet connectivity at the school. You probably have some help desk folks and things like that. So it's a uh, common and definitely something to consider if you're looking at a career in technology. And to add on to that, we actually like to call ourselves systems engineers, and that's because it takes all of that to make a supercomputer. It takes the big computer, it takes the networking, it takes storage, and it also takes a facility to hold it in. And we, systems engineers, we do all four of those things. So we manage computers, we manage the storage, we manage the network, and we also help deal with the facility, the cooling of the computers and all of that stuff as well. So it takes four things, like kind of four pillars to do uh, a big supercomputing system like Cheyenne. Compute, storage, networking, facilities. And, and we Jeanette, we, we, and we had a yeah. follow on, we have a question that's related to that. Uh, how do you know, well, hopefully, you know, how much is actually stored there and what happens if something breaks? Yeah, Jerry, do you want to talk about how these disks are aggregated? Sure. I think for the storage, really, okay. I don't have the exact numbers, but one of the file systems is roughly 80% full, and the other is about 50% full. Um, and when things break, so the most common failure is a disk just failing. It just you know stops running, it stops spinning, it just completely dies. And so luckily, we have these grouped up using a technology called RAID, which stands for Redundant Array of Inexpensive Disks. And what it does is it kind of duplicates the data onto more disks than necessary so that if a disk does fail, you can just replace it with a new one, and there will be a rebuild process that happens. OK. I don't know if my internet and just it, cut out. Oh, no, you're still there. <laughs> we can see you. And here, okay, uh, and and you said we have fifty percent. One of the file systems is fifty percent full, and the other is eighty percent full. If they were entirely full, do we know what that number would be if they were both at a hundred percent? Which we don't want to get there, but yeah, the total the capacity is one hundred and twenty-eight petabytes uh, combined across both of them. So one hundred and twenty-eight quadrillion bytes. Is that what that means? <laughs> yes which is roughly that's 2 million iPhones for comparison. Wow, that's amazing. And we did have questions uh, specifically about what kind of degree do you need a bachelor's or master's to work there in Wyoming? Is that how you get to work at the NCAR Wyoming Supercomputing Center? I would say it's not required, but you definitely need to have good Linux administration skills. Um, and a lot of those can be self-taught, basically, or going to classes or these certifications. Like, there's lots of opportunities these days to learn this stuff. Yeah, I, I have a degree. I have a master's degree in computer science. But um, I work, I've worked with people who don't have a degree at all, and no, no college degree. So you can have a wide range of educational experiences and still be a systems engineer. OK, and uh, thank you. And we do have another technical question about the heat from the supercomputers and how you keep it cool enough to run. And is there an upper temperature threshold? Um, could you address any of those questions about the temperature and how we keep things cool in there? Well, but just talking about Glade, right? It's all cooled with again the these these tiles, and we have big air conditioning units that deal with that heat. And there is a capacity, and there are facility staff here that help us figure out what is our cooling capacity, and what kind of heat are these systems going to generate, and can we put these in the system in the, in the machine room? Can it handle it? And if it can't. There are ways that we can actually expand the data center 
to have more cooling capacity so that we can bring in things that produce more heat. So there's a whole bunch of calculations that go on whenever we acquire a new system to make sure that not only we can cool it, but can we power it? Do we have the room for it too? Do we have the networking for it? So we, we consider all of that when we acquire systems, including the cooling that's required for the system. So that's calculated so, and, and we go from there, yeah. That, that sounds like an awfully complex uh, process. And on, on top of that, we did have a question about um, just how long it took to build the storage system. And I, I think we have a time lapse of bringing in the supercomputer. And while we show that, could you talk a little bit about how long it took to build the storage system? Sure. I think, if I remember right, I think physically building it was probably maybe a week or so. Um, just imagine many, imagine many, many boxes filled with hard drives and you have to take out 17,000 drives and, you know, unpack them and put them in the slot and then, you know, move on to the next box. And so there's a lot of cardboard and plastic left over after the installation. Okay. But I'd say it's probably a week or so to physically install it and then maybe double that again to actually configure it in the software and then get it connected to the supercomputer. Great. We're coming up on time for this month's Meet the Expert. Uh, would do you have any? We've talked about a lot of a lot of aspects of being a systems engineer and and up there at the the storage unit and the supercomputer. Are there any final thoughts you'd like to uh, leave us with today? Um, I guess I would say that I first became a systems administrator in seventh grade, just working in my school's library. They had a brand new, you know, lab of Macintoshes with color screens and, you know, they needed software installed and that's just how I got started. Um, I kind of did the same thing through high school and college, just working, you know, kind of for the school on the systems that they had. And then I applied here after that. So I would say it's definitely not too late to get started. <laughs> uh, let's see, I, I was a system administrator just uh, running like mail servers and things like that, like an email server. Um, and then I got uh, asked if I wanted to come join a biz center that was at the university I was working at. And so I went there and they had a really tiny cluster that ran a big piled wall. Um, so it was about 12 computers in that cluster. And that was my first cluster. And then there was also, they had supercomputers at that university. So I helped operate those. Um, and that's how I got into this. I just kind of fell into it, working at Purdue University. So, and now here I am at NCAR. So. Perfect. And uh, and this is the only supercomputer at NCAR, is that, for NCAR, is that correct? No, there, there, there's another one. We have a development and visualization cluster that we call Casper. And it's a bit smaller cluster. It only has 150-ish 100, machines in it. Uh, you know, it's a couple hundred at most. And uh, so it's much smaller, uh, but it's used to kind of do some of the things that Cheyenne's not good at. So... Uh, Casper, for instance, has GPUs in it, and these are specialized processors that you can use to do even faster calculations than Cheyenne can do, but they're specialized, so they're hard to use. So there are people in uh, climate studies that are trying to figure out how to use GPUs, and so they'll use Casper to explore that. Um, or visualize their data, that's another thing that Casper does as well. So we do have two main clusters here. I don't know, Ben's, Ben's, Ben's gesturing. We have, we, have, we have small clusters, too. We have a test cluster. Oh, yeah, he's going to show you. He wants to show you Casper. Let's go show you Casper. We have a couple test clusters. That's about it, but this is, this is our other one. You want to go in here or you want to do outside? 
Can we go in? All right. So this is the back. It's kind of cool from the back. And it's getting a little loud in here. Uh, not as hot as the storage, I will tell you that. So warm, but not as hot. And you can see all these, you know, these are all the different computers here that you see. And they've got all the networking connected to them. That's these here. They've also got power, each one. And it goes all the way down and all the way down there. So, so that's our Casper system. It's not as dense as Cheyenne, so the computers are much larger. In Cheyenne, we fit four computers in a very small space. Here, it's one computer in a very large space. So it's a much bigger footprint, um, or maybe the same footprint as Cheyenne, about the same space it takes up, but it's only about, a, what, maybe a, uh, you know, it's, not, it's only like a couple hundred instead of 4,000. Just can't do the math that fast. <laughs> 100th uh, size computer wise, something like that. Wow, thank you for that bonus peek at Casper. That's, that's really something we didn't even expect today. And before we do our closing out there, uh, Summer would like to add uh, some takeaways for our visitors as well. Summer. Absolutely. Um, and before we go there, I see that there is a question, um, and I, I think maybe I'll throw it back to Pam real quick here. It says, what is Casper? Or I'm sorry, again, not Pam, a, Jeanette. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, that's right. Um, again, it's a, it's a development and visualization cluster. So just like Cheyenne, it's got individual computers in it, and we have connected it together with a very fast network. Um, and then we utilize those computers in concert to solve problems. But the, the kinds of things they're looking at on Casper are more of development kinds of things, uh, trying to play around with newer processors and newer, what we call accelerators, or that's what a GPU is. So playing around with those to see if they can be a benefit to climate studies. So it's not kind of the workhorse cluster, it's more of the kind of development and seeing where the future lies, right, for like climate studies and things like that. Thank you, Janet. Um, so one of the things that I did want to mention as we're wrapping up is there is a virtual visit that we had created and it lets you go through the NCAR Wyoming Supercomputing Center. So uh, along the lines of what we talked about a little bit ago, there is also um, a tutorial in there to walk you through making your own supercomputer uh, using Raspberry Pi. So our supercomputer is called Cheyenne. And in this instruction manual, it will show you how to make a PyAnn. So it's a play on words, right? But um, you can create your own supercomputer and it will also run our weather modeling forecast software called WARF. Um, so it, it looks like Katie went ahead and put our link to that in there. Also, you can see uh, everything that we talked about here today, uh, the drawers open on the storage system, uh, the cabinets open on the supercomputer as well. It talks about some of our older supercomputers that we had here in our Wyoming data center. Um, and to answer one of the questions that was kind of up in the list, we currently have one supercomputer in our facility, but we are acquiring a second one and it's called Derecho. Um, Derecho will be a 19 petaflop supercomputer, so that's 19 quadrillion math calculations per second. Cheyenne is 5.3, um, so we're a, a little over tripling our speed in being able to process data. And um, again, that was funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, our supercomputers last about five years, and I think uh, Janet and and folks might need to explain if the storage outlasts that or if the storage grows with that and, and is reusable. But um, definitely that information is listed in the link there for our virtual visit app. Well, we'd love to thank all of our guests, Summer Watson, Joey, Jeanette, at the NCAR Wyoming Supercomputing Center. And uh, thank you all for joining us. But, and you might've noticed there were a lot of uh, extra tidbits added today, but it doesn't stop there. Uh, next February 10th or next month, February 10th, you can join us to really dig down deep into what exactly does it mean to do coding on the next Meet the Experts? We'll have Max Grover 
to share how he uses the supercomputer and supercomputer and coding skills to improve our global climate model. So for those of you who ask, well, like, how does this really make our, our, our lives better? Uh, join us again and you'll get to dig even deeper into what exactly do we do with these computers? Research is a big part of what we do. And that even includes uh, how to make the computers better. So thank you again for joining us and we will see you next time on Meet the Experts. February 10th. <laughs> wow.